describe Aliquippa for me? Aliquippa was really a nice town. Had a lot of stores. People could just go out any time they wanted to. And I really loved to live in Aliquippa. All nationalities were getting along just fine and everything, but it just went to pots lately. There's hardly any stores down there to mount to anything. And people are just moving out, really, of Aliquippa. Remember, we want to stay in the 30s, okay? Don't bring me up until today. But tell me when you began working at JNL and describe your job. Oh, really? I don't remember when I started working in JNL. I was only 15 then, and I'm 80 now, so that was when. And Let's stop. Stop. Because we have to figure out this year. Camera's got speed. I began working in JNL in 1927, and I was a, a tin sorter at that time. That means you just flop tin and look for bad spots on the tin. And I worked there about 10 years or so, something like that. Can you tell me in a little bit more detail about what you did, what your specific job was, and whether or not the work was hard or dangerous or whatever. Can you describe that? The work was hard. It was dangerous because a tin cut like a knife. You have to start over again. Wait, can I talk now? Wait, I want to talk. Now. As a tin assorter, the tin was wide and it was sharp. I mean, it was really sharp. And it was dangerous because if that slipped, you're bound to get cut. And uh, we had to put out so much, they, they just wanted so much put out every day. You either did it or else. And that's what we did until the things got rough. And they kept wanting more and more and more. And uh, we just couldn't keep up with it. So when they wanted more, we said we'd do more work, providing they'd give us more money, but they wouldn't do that. And that's when we started out on a strike, first strike. Tell me about Again, more about working conditions. I mean, hours that you work, vacations, your relationship with the supervisors and so forth. Well, we worked there. We had to put in eight hours a day. And uh, we got a, a rest period in the afternoon, lunch period rather. And uh, we go to the restroom. We'd have to tell our boss we're going to the restroom. And really, with the boss, it wasn't that good. I mean, we just didn't get along that good because he just wanted more and more. And I happened to be shop steward, and so there was no love lost there at all. But we tried to do the best we could, and we didn't satisfy him because he just kept wanting more until we thought we couldn't do it for that money. Okay, and so you were pretty dissatisfied with the working conditions. Right. And then there was an effort for, from the amalgamated to organize a tin mill. Can you tell me about that effort and why it did not work? Why it was unsuccessful? Oh, it did work. There was only a few girls that didn't join the union. No, the amalgamated. At the amalgamated. There was, okay. there was only a few girls that didn't join. Most of us were all in there, you know. And uh, well, we did good. You know, it was hard. It was an effort to talk them into it because everybody was scared at that time to join. but. We got the job done. Why was everyone afraid to join? Well, because if they found... Everyone was afraid to join because? Everyone was afraid to join because if JNL would have found out that they were joining, signing up for the union, they wouldn't have had a job the next day. They would have left them go. And so that's why they were scared to sign up or join. Now, as an organizer for the Amalgamated, what specifically did you do? I was a shop steward for the Amalgamated. If they had problems with their boss, if one of the girls would have problem with their boss, well then they would come to me and I'd try to solve it with the boss. And sometime it would work. Most of the times it worked. And one time it didn't work. And that's when we went out. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, the boss come up and he was dissatisfied with how much work we put out. And we said, uh, well, you want us to put out more work? And he said, yes, we do. And I said, well, I'll talk it over with the girls. I talked it over with the girls. 
And the majority of them said, we, we're willing to put out more work, but we also want more money. Well, Jane L. didn't want to give us more money. So we got together and we decided we'd go out on strike to see if we could get more money. And most of the girls were not. I, I'd say maybe about eight girls stayed in. The rest of us went on. Now, can you tell me more about the company's attitude towards union organizers, in particular to, uh, their attitude towards you? What kind of things that they do or say or whatever to discourage you, discourage your organizing effort? Well, they really didn't say much to me about it. When I joined, they knew that I joined because I told them, and I said, I'm shop steward here. We're going to either work together or we'll work separate, and it'll be tough. I said, if we work each one on our own. And so really, he didn't like it, and he didn't make it too easy. If he could get away with it, he didn't make it too easy. Mr. Miller was really hot and heavy against the union. He didn't want it in there, but it got in there. <clears throat> now, first there was the amalgamated. Yeah. Um, and then they came up with these ERPs. Yeah. Tell me how you as workers felt about the ERPs. Well, me, myself, it didn't bother me. And it didn't, evidently it didn't bother the rest of the girls because they didn't complain about it. But Jane L. had a union in there, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was a Jane L. union, so how much good could it do the ERP or anybody else that would come in there that wasn't for the Jane L. union? And we weren't. Okay, so, I mean, what happened with the JNL union? Did they did they do anything to help? Did they did they just try to pacify you guys? Tell me more about the JNL union, which was Jane, uh, the Jane L. Yeah. Okay. Jane L. had its own representative for JNL union, and her and I did speak about it, and I told her I said join the union with us and. We'll get something. I said, we can't resolve nothing like this. I said, because Jane L's going to win. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah. Calling a spade and we're all set. And so I talked to the girl. I said, why don't you come along with us? No, you're getting ready to tell me about the Jane L Union. You're going to say the Jane L, the Jane L Union, whatever. The Jane L Union representative. I spoke to her. I can't recall her name. And I said, now you know that they're not helping us out. They're going to be for Jane L, and that's not helping us out any. Come along with us. Well, she wouldn't do it. She was a Jane L representative, and that's all there was to it. And I said, well, then we'll have an election. So we did have an election. And we come through, I'd say, about 94% easy. 94% was for ERP, for the union. So they lost out, and they had to recognize our union. So now, okay. yeah. Okay. And let me see that again, uh, Don. Okay. Don't forget, you're telling me about the the JML union. Yeah. And anytime. Well, we uh, we had an election, and JNL won out. So that's how I became the representative of JNL, Shop Stewart, rather. And from then on, they had to start recognizing us. And of course, Mr. Miller was our boss, and he didn't like it. But he didn't have too much choice, because a majority of us was in the union now. Okay. Now, you said that the amalgamated was working. Yeah. Why is it then that you wanted to go, you moved over to the CIO and the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, if the amalgamated was working? Really, I can't tell you that, Dante. I don't know whether that was Timko's idea or whose idea it was. I don't know why they went over to it. Okay. Well, tell me what happened when the Steel Workers Organizing Committee came and, and began organizing JNL. Well, when they first came, you know, they had. Uh, they, you had to tell me CIO or. The or CIO. Or, or, or the e ERP. Now, what was there first? The ERP was there first, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody was trying to sign up. The people that was working in there was trying to sign other people up for the union or the CIO or the RP, whatever it was at that time. And, of course, they had to walk in the alleys with these 
applications in their hat or wherever they could hide them. That's what they did. Because if they didn't, they were in trouble. I mean, they didn't mind shooting at you, which they did. They didn't mind beating you up, which they did. So that's the way it was at that time. Okay, can you tell me more about that? By, by they, you mean, I mean, you have to tell me who they were and, again, specifically, what they did to discourage the organizing of the, of the, of the steel workers. Well, they were the people that were for JNL that did not want the union to go in. And those were the people that were after the ones that were trying to sign up or the ones that were trying to belong to it. Those were the people that were beaten up whoever they could beat up that they thought would belong to the union. And, those, and also those were the people that were shooting at you. The ones were from JNL that were for JNL and not for the union. <laughs> Well, when, when uh, CIO came in, JNL, of course, had their own, we called them stool pigeon at that time. They did exactly what JNL wanted them to do. JNL told them, go out and beat their brains in. That's exactly what they did. They'd come after us with clubs, and so many people had to walk in the alleys, and, and we didn't know who they were. It, it could be your next door neighbor, but that's the way JNL operated. They were going to get us one way or another. So that's about it. So can you remember any specific incidents that happened uh, to you personally or to anyone that you knew? Yeah. Can you tell me I, I can really remember this one because <laughs> it wasn't too easy to take. We were out trying to sign people. Mike Keller, Dominic, my husband, and I went out to sign people up. And as we came back, we were parking in front of Mike Keller's house and we were talking. And we were starting to get out of the car, and somebody passed and took a shot at the car. Broke the glass in the front of the car. They must have been going a little too fast, but they got the glass, but they didn't get Mike or I. And then my husband and Mike Keller tried to get the car. They went after this, tried to catch him, but they didn't do it. If they had it, then we would have known who some of them stool pigeons were that was operating for J&L. Now... Were, was JNL successful? Did people uh, refuse to join or did people um, uh, quit as a result of these um, tactics, this violence from JNL? No, they didn't quit, but they really didn't have nothing. To, you know, JNL just kept their own. And ours, the ones that belonged to the union, got laid off, got cut down on days. They did exactly what they wanted. Turned out to be a ghost town. They had nothing. You know, a lot of them didn't have anything to eat. There was a place they called down the Y, was a Washington restaurant. And they had what they called a soup line down there. People would go down there with the little pots and things to go get soup or something to eat. Tell me more about um, JNL firing or laying people off that were involved in the union. Tell me more about that. If you can remember any specific stories or any specific incidents, how it would happen, just... Yeah, I can remember some, like Angelo Volpe, Brandy, a group of them that had, were signing people up. They got laid off. They told them they, they didn't need them anymore. They had no jobs. They got laid off. But then after the union got in, then people fought back, and they got paid for all the time they were off that J-Nail had let them go. Now, there was about, there was quite a few of them, but I can't remember all the names. Now, when you, when you, the union organizers, were suspicious about someone being a stool pigeon or a snitch, right. what would you do? How did you, how did you treat those people? How did you continue to interact with them or deal with them? Well, I myself didn't deal with them. I, you know, I just tell, tell them. Tell me when we thought someone was a... Well, I myself, if I thought somebody was a stool pigeon, I just didn't want to bother with them, and i tell them, I don't want to be bothering with you. You're working for JNL. And I'm not working for JNL. I'm trying to organize against JNL, so there's no use of us, you know, being friends. I don't mind being friends, but then I don't want to tell them none of my business. I don't want them to tell me theirs. Now, another thing that JNL did um, from our previous conversation and from the reading that we've done is they accused many of the organizers of being communists. Now, can you tell me about that, uh, whether or not there was communist involvement? And if so, 
Did it make any difference? Did anyone care? Well, they said there was communists involved. I, I couldn't swear to that, but they had quite a few that we had the names, and I, I really don't want to mention names if I don't have to, but they branded quite a few of them as communists. And uh, we talked to them, you know, just as uh, people that you talk ordinary out in the street, but that's about it. We had nothing to do with them. You had nothing to do with the communists? No, really, I didn't. I can only speak for myself. Really. Now, do you have any idea why um, Phil Murray and John L. Lewis recruited communists as organizers? Well, I only think they, they recruited them because they wanted to get all they could, as many people as they could get in there, which I don't blame them, you know, if they're communists, but still they were working in JNL. Quite a few of them that I know were working in JNL, so naturally, you know, they were going to try to recruit them too. And uh, they did turn out to be union people. Okay. Now, tell me about how uh, the Republican Party uh, dominated politics in Aliquippa and the Republican Party's relationship with JNL. Jay Nell told the people what to do. The ones that were Republicans took orders from Jay Nell, and they did exactly what they wanted him to do. And that's how this all started. The ones that were not Jay Nell stooges would not take orders from the Republicans. As a matter of fact, Jay Nell would send people in, the, the big supervisors would send people in to try to pick us up, take us out to vote, and register the way they wanted us to vote, register Republican. They never did it to me, but they did it to some of the people that I worked with that had to go down and register. And they did to save their jobs, not because they wanted to be Republicans. So people were forced to vote? Absolutely. People were forced to vote the way Jane L. wanted them to vote. Can you tell me, like, I mean, how that would happen? You, you know, I mean, would a foreman come up and say, hey, come on, it's time for you? I mean, just tell me how that would happen. I know you, knew, I know you said that they did, it didn't happen to you, no, but how did it happen to other people? Well, they would send a car up, they'd send a guy up with a car, say, now we got to go out to register. And you have to register Republican if you want to keep your job. So naturally, you're not working. Anyways, you're just getting a few days, so you want to hang on to that. So you go re register Republicans. That's how come they were so far ahead of us. Now, the truck story. Remember you told me this story about when you did go out on strike and the mail truck came. Right. Tell me that story from beginning to end. How much we got, Rick? Where are we? I can't tell you. I have to cut for a second. Give me a second on that, Dante. And any time. Okay. JNL was always opposed to union because they were the boss. Whatever they said went. And they knew if a union come in, they were going to give them a hard time because the union wasn't going to do what they wanted them to do. And that's why they were opposed. And they really fought us, and they fought us the best way they knew how. And we fought back the best way we knew how. Of course, we won out. Now, tell me a little bit more about how JNL dominated the town in terms of owning the utilities and how they owned almost everything. Well, like I told you, they, they were the controlling power because they had the jobs, they had the say-so over everything, and there was nothing that people could do, you know, unless they really wanted to take a chance at losing their jobs. And that's how JNL controlled everything. They knew they had the people scared to death, and that's how they controlled the people till they got sick and tired of it and they was going to take a chance, go out and sign for the union and take a chance. Tell me about JNL's relationship with the police department. They definitely controlled the police department. Captain Bach, which I said I wasn't going to mention any name, but he was a big chief, you know, and he did control the police department, and they did exactly what Jane L. wanted them to do, or else they wouldn't have had a job either until the union came in. After the union came in, then they were free to do as they wanted to. Now, can you tell me more about this Captain Mock? I mean, can you remember anything specifically he did? I mean, was he a total jerk or... What? Just he was me. a total jerk. 
What? <laughs> I need you to tell me that all over again, and, and you have to tell me his name. <laughs> well, all I can tell you is that Captain Mark ran the show, especially with the police department. He ran the show. They did in town what they wanted to. And if the poor people in town seen a cop coming close to them, they were scared to death. They knew they were in for trouble. And that's how Captain Mark controlled everything. He had a real tight on everybody. Okay. How much, Rick? Is that it? No, I still got a minute. A minute? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you tell me any more about the Republican Party and uh, the process of getting a job at JNL? Getting a job at JNL. Yeah, you told me before that you know they would ask you how you were registered. There. Right. If you went to JNL for a job, that's the first thing they asked you how you were registered. And if you weren't registered Republican, you didn't get the job, or otherwise you went down and registered Republican. That's how you got a job. That was it. Now, what if? Um, how could they check? Could they check to see? Very easy. Very tell easy. Tell me about that. They could check very easy. Go down to the courthouse. Go down to the register at the courthouse, and they could find out how you were registered. They controlled the co county courthouse. They controlled everything. It was darn easy for them to go down there and say, I want to know how, for instance, I want to know how Mary Cozicoli is registered. And believe me, they tell them in a minute, and they would know. And if they found out that you weren't registered the way that they told you told them you were, then what? Then they came up to you and they asked you, are you registered? And if you told them no, and then they'd tell you, yes, you are, you're a registered Democrat. You're either going to register a Republican or you're not going to have a job. I mean, they didn't pull no punches. They told you. That was it. Now, like in 1937, when we started to organize, we went down to the Jane L. Tunnel. That means at the entrance of Jane L., the big entrance of Jane L. Whole group of us, Joe, myself, and a whole bunch of us were down there picketing so that people wouldn't go in Jane L. to work. Well, here comes this mail truck along, and he wants to get into Jane L. because he's a government official, you know, J. He's a mailman. So, a group of us said to him, Where are you going? Say me. Where are you going? I said, we're going into JNL. So I said to him, what are you going into JNL for? Well, we have to bring the mail in. Well, let me see what's in that truck. Let me see the mail that's going in there. No, you can't see. This is government business. Well, we're, we're fooling government business here, too. I said, we're starving. And there was a bunch of women with umbrellas, man. They went after that mailman like nobody's business. And uh, we said, you're not going into Jane L. That's all there is to it, unless you let us see what's in there. Well, this mailman stuck to his guns. You're not, no, you're not going to see what's in there. This is mail. This is government mail, and we're going in there. So everybody got angry, and they just upset at the mail truck. And that's all there was to it. And there was no mail in there. There was sandwiches in there. There was pop. There was stuff for them to eat and keep staying. Them little stoolies that was working for Jane L., got to stay in the mill as long as they wanted, as long as they could feed them. They didn't care. They, they were paying them to stay in there. So they didn't care. They just stayed in there and bring me the food in, boy, and I'll, I'll do all right. And that, that was it. So we upset at the mail truck, and there was no mail in there, nothing but food. Good. Now, can you tell me what Roosevelt and his New Deal programs meant to your organizing effort? Man, they saved our life. Yep. They, uh, the, uh, J you have to tell me, you got to, got to include Roosevelt's name in New Deal. Well, Roosevelt saved our life, New Deal. Governor Earl, when we were down there on the picket line, you know, Governor Earl came down because they was in under the tunnel with these big hoes trying to get us with the water so we'd have to leave there. Well, Governor Earl came down with his state troopers. Of course, we had clubs. He said to us, you put all your clubs down. He said, I'm going in there, and, and then people will not put water on you. We said, well, go in there and tell them not to put water on us, and we'll put the club down. Governor Earl said, no, you put the clubs down. So we did. We put the clubs down. He went in, and he made them quit hosing us with, them, with that water. And they were, that was our salvation. If uh, 
Roosevelt had not have been in there and Governor Earl wouldn't have been in there. Wouldn't have been so easy for us, I'll tell you, truthfully. I mean, there'd have been a lot of people that were dead because they were aiming to have a union. That's all there was to it. Okay. Now tell me uh, a little bit more about Roosevelt and uh, what the Wagner Act meant to the organizing effort and how that helped you guys organize. Well, that gave us the lead, were they? That gave the... The Wagner Act, you got to tell me again. Gotta... The Wagner Act really gave us the lead, you know, with President... Uh... Wait a minute, did I step on her? Yeah, we overlapped. Tell me that again. Yeah, but you have to wait till I get finished talking. Now. Well, Roosevelt was the one that helped us out, got the Wagner Act. When they got the Wagner Act, that sort of untied our hands to go and sign people up for the Union. And it made us made it a lot easier for us. And then Governor Earl came in and made it easier again. So that, that gave us a big help. Now, how did you feel when you were able to pick the union of your choice when the Supreme Court upheld the Wagner Act? Oh, boy. Tell me about it. We were really, really happy. We had a parade. I'll tell you, that street was loaded with people going up the street, celebrating, hollering, and screaming. That was the best day of our life, I'll tell you. <laughs> now, why did the steel workers and the CIO feel it was important to become involved in electoral politics? You know, you went out and you started organizing your Democratic clubs and registering people to vote. Why is it that you felt that that was so important? Because one hand was... You got to tell me... We, you have to tell me we felt it was important to move into politics because. Yeah, it was important to wait move. Okay. Wait, wait for the plane to go. We okay? Yeah. It was important for to get involved in politics because that sort of untied our hands. Once we got the mayor and council in Aliquippa, then we could do mostly what we wanted to. Before that, we couldn't because they had the Republican mayor, they had a Republican council, and they ran the town. So they had to get involved. They had to really get tied up together, the union and the um, council and the mayor and, all, you know, politics and the union had to get together. That's all there was to it. Now, how did you feel when um, SWAT candidates began winning, like in 1937? What did that mean? How did you feel? What... When who began? When your candidates began winning elections to begin oh, voting the Republicans yeah. out. Well, we had a Democrat club, and we started to elect a, a mayor, a Democrat mayor. And I'll tell you, some of those police officers were so happy. There was one was called Poole. I will mention his name. He came up, and he shot the police out. I mean, he pulled the guns out, and he went to town. That's how happy he was. He was shooting in the club, not at anyone at the wall, but that's how happy he was that the uh, Democrat, the, the council and uh, the union got together, the politicians and union got together, and they got their first Democrat mayor, the council. Now, did you guys think of uh, what the union was doing, I mean, what the company was doing to you as a violation of basic civil liberties? I mean, they wouldn't let you get together, uh, free assembly, free speech. Tell me what you remember about that, or if you ever talked about that, or how you felt about it. Well, really, we, we knew that they was taking all our liberties. Okay. Airplane. And we're all set. Well, we felt that Jane L. was taking everything away from us. They took our rights away. They took our liberties away, everything. We couldn't do anything without their okay, unless we got a union in. And after we got the union, of course, things started to change. So we had to fight for it, but we got it. And in terms of taking that union movement and moving it into electoral politics, because the way that JNL controlled the sheriffs and the judges and whatnot, can you tie that together for me? Well, had, after uh, we start organizing and we got the union in, we thought now we have to have politics in here. We've, we've got to beat the mayor that they had, the sheriff. We had. Coughlin, I think, was old Lachlan or someone like that, that was the sheriff, and he was tough. He was a tough Republican. 
And we figured we had to beat him. And the only way we could beat him was if the union got together with the, the leaders of the union. And they did do that. And we did get our first Democrat mayor. Now, you told me a little bit about it before, but the hoses, when they had the, the hoses on the strikers during the 1937 strike, can you tell me more about that specifically? What happened and where you were? And did they actually turn the water on you and if there were injuries? Well, Jane L. figured the only way they could get us away from the tunnel would be if they came in with water hose. And they did. They were on the inside, which would be Jane L. We were on the outside, which was the entrance to Jane L. And they came with these water hoses full blast, trying to get us away from there. They didn't succeed. I mean, we got soaking wet. There was women there with umbrellas, open umbrellas, holding them in front of them to keep this water away from them. But they didn't succeed. And the men, they stood their ground. God love them. They stood their ground. They wasn't going to move. And then when they upset the mail truck that was coming in, the water hose, no, Governor Earl came down and took the water hose off. He said, uh, this got to stop. And that's when that stopped. Now, when you think back about it, when you think back on the Union and all that you went through and all that you guys accomplished, what makes you the most proud? What do you think the, the people should know about you guys' effort? What makes me really proud is that I see some of these older people now that are getting a pension because we went for the strike, we struck, and then Roosevelt was there, which helped us out. And if we wouldn't have stood to our ground, many of these people wouldn't even been working in JNL today. They would have got rid of them. So I'm proud of that. I'm proud that the union come in and that we were part of it. Do you think that um, that your organizing effort did much or anything at all, not only to change Aliquippa, but to change America, to change this country? I think that by us organizing and doing the best that we could possibly do, that we did change. We changed Beaver County, we changed Aliquippa, the country followed, you know, they did their share too. I mean, it wasn't only us, they did their share all over. And that, that's what happened, you know. And I think everybody benefited by it. And they're still benefiting by it. And can you tell me <clears throat> how the country and Beaver and Aliquippa changed? Well, they're getting much more benefits now than they were getting that. They're getting workman's compensation. They're getting a lot of benefits. And Jane L isn't controlling no more. So they're free to say what they want to say, do what they want to say, in most cases, you know. And there isn't a thing that uh, Jane L can do. So th they're really free people now. Good. Let's stop. How much we got? Yeah, stop while it's good. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's good. <laughs> and we're all set here. Cool. Well, there was quite a few people got fired from Jane L because Jane L found out that they were out trying to organize and sign people up. So they, they fired quite a few of them. But then the union stepped in after we got organized, the union was in. They had to pay them people back for all the time they lost. That they were off of work, they had to pay them for that. And we were happy, believe me, we were all smiles. As you could see on some of them pictures, we were happy. <laughs> ah, boy, we had them. <laughs> okay, so now tell me the story about your friend or your co-worker Skiba, oh. who wouldn't join the union but wanted to take advantage of yeah. your effort. Well, we were working in, in, in the tin mill in JNL, sorting tin. And the boss, Mr. Miller, wasn't satisfied because he knew we had already joined the union. He was hot. And so he wanted more work put out. So me being a shop steward, I talked to the girls and they said, well, we'll put more work out if they pay us more money. So I told the boss, I said, well, you pay us more money. We'll put out more work. He said, no. I said, well, okay then. We'll put out the work. So I, I did. I put out the work all right, but I had a stoolie in front of me. I would grab it. As the tin is like on one side is the tin. They pile it in. They bring it in. Then you put it be in front of you, and you sort it. You get the bad ones out. You put it on one side, and the ones that are really bad, you put on the other side. 
Well, they wanted more tin out. I give more tin. I got it by the handful. I told the rest of the girls, don't you do it because we're going to get fired. I got it by the handful and I put it over here where all the good tin was at. Well, the stoolie was in front of me. She goes and tells the boss. Finally, I get a tap on the shoulder. So what are you doing? Putting out more work. You wanted more work? You got it, babe. Here it is. So he said, did you sort that? I said, no, you just said more work and you got more work. He said, well, pick up your check and go home. I said, uh-uh, you take my check. You know what to do with it, I'm going home. I said, I'll be back. And he said, no, you pick up your check. I said, I'm not doing it. I went home, but I didn't go straight home. I stopped at the union. I said, I don't wanna work there no more. I said, these people are miserable and they're making me miserable. And uh, Clifford Shorts said, you are going back because you'll make us look bad. Paul Norman Clifford Short. I said, the only way I'll go back is if I get the first vacation they give out, because it was almost time for vacation. So they talked to this Mr. Dye, who was at a JNL, and said, uh, well, we can bring her back, but she wants the first, uh, what you call, vacation. So I got the first vacation. And when I got the vacation, they came and told me I got the vacation. He said, uh, you get the first vacation thought. I said, okay, now I'll go pick my check because I'm not coming back. And I left and went. So the, uh, Clifford Schwartz and Paul Dormont made me go back because it made them look bad. So we had this meeting with the girls, all of us girls and myself, had a meeting. We were going to call Mr. Dye in and Clifford Schwartz. Clifford Schwartz was a CIO representative. Mr. Dye was a Jane L representative. So they both came up, and we were talking, and I told our girls, don't be ignorant. Don't say anything when Mr. Dye talks. So they didn't. Soon as Clifford Short started talking, well, this Felicia Skiba and her three little handful there, they started. So I said, Phyllis, please keep quiet. We didn't do that to you. Don't do it to us. She said, well, you SOB. I don't have to. Well, she didn't say SOB. She said something else. But I said, you're talking about my mother. You're not talking about me. I said, don't do that. She said, you are an SOB. So I went for her, and the girls grabbed me and said, you're crazy, that's what they want. You'll get fired, you're fighting in JNL. Let her go. I said, okay. So I let her go, and I said, pal, I'll meet you on the outside of JNL. I said, when we go, I'll meet you. So when we left, at JNL, there's a bunch of steps you gotta go down. Before I hit the bottom step, the third one before I hit the bottom, I said, Phyllis, I don't want to fight with you. Take it back. You call me name, but don't call me that. That's my mother you're talking about. She called me that again. I forgot there was three steps. I jumped them. And I went down, and we went. We started it. We went for it. Well, man, I wanted to rip her mouth open. I said, she ain't never going to call nobody that again. She outsmarted me. She come down with her teeth on my fingers. I thought I lost her fingers. Good thing I had long nails. I stuck them in her throat. She opened her mouth, and we went to town again. Here comes some poor old man with a bucket. He puts a bucket down. He's trying to separate us. Three of my girlfriends are there, you know. They took her glasses off and threw them on the side so that I don't break her glasses. This poor old man puts a bucket down. He tries to separate us. I picked the bucket up and I hit her in the head with it. So pretty soon they did separate us. After they separated us, I go home. The next day, I'm coming out of JNL. There's a chief of police. Now, the chief of police is our chief now. The Democrats are in and you know, the union's in. He said, Mary, come here. I said, what for? He said, I want to talk to you. So he said, what'd you do yesterday? I, said, I don't know, what'd I do? He said, who'd you fight with? I said, oh, Skiba. He said, I want you to go home, brush your hair, comb it, whatever you do, get your hair and put it in an envelope. I said, why? He said, well, Skiba went to Beaver and had you arrested in Beaver. I said, why in Beaver? He said, well, she said that you pull strings in Aliquippa, they're not gonna do nothing to her. So she went to Beaver. I said, well, what about the hair? Well, she's got an envelope full of hair. I said, Jenkins, I don't fight like that. I never touched her hair. Well, I'm telling you to do that. I said, and I'm not gonna do it. I didn't pull her hair, she didn't pull mine, and I'm not doing it. So we did do it, and after that, we got called into court, myself, and the other three girls that helped me out, and they really didn't fight. They had nothing to do with it except to help her out, mostly, throw the glasses away so I don't break them. And we go to court, and I get parole, $300 fine, <laughs> which the union paid for the fine, but I got my parole. So I got up, and I thought she was still there. And 
I got up, I went looking for her, God was with me. She left, I don't know where she went, but she was gone and it was all right, everything was okay. But the girl went back to work, and it wasn't a month later. I was at the Democratic Club, and uh, Joe Perello's wife was there. She hears a knock on the door, she goes and opens the door, and here was Phyllis Skiba, wants to talk to Mary Kozakoli. And uh, Isabel, which was Joe Perello's wife, said, no, what do you want with her? Well, I just want to talk to her. So she called me. And she said, uh, Phyllis Skiba's out there. She wants to talk to you. And we're coming out with you because it was dark where it was at. And I said, no. If she's by herself and I get the daylights knocked out of me, I got it coming. If I can let her beat me, then that's it. I get it coming. I said, but if there's more than one, sure. I said, you call my sister and you come out. So she, I said, what do you want, Phyllis? I want to talk to you. So she come in. As she come in the door, the bathroom was right here, toilet. She come in. I said, let's go in here and talk. I thought, well, baby, your head's going down in this toilet now. If you keep it up, because I'm not bothering you, it's all over, let's forget about it, you know. She said, I want to tell you, she said, I just got fired. I said, what, they fire sewer rats? Because Skiba was walking under the Aliquippa uh, tunnel to go from Stone Arch all the way to Jane L. Tunnel, all underground she was walking at, so that she could get on the inside of Jane L. to go to work, because she knew she was on the outside, them strikers would have got her. I said, you mean to tell me they fire? She said, yeah, I got fired. She said, I just come in to tell you that I'm sorry for what I did. I said, well, that was your rights. If you didn't want to belong to the union, that was all right, that was your right. But why didn't you turn down the money? When we got the raise, why didn't you just let it go at that? Turn it down, you didn't work for it. You didn't come out and strike with us. But no, you took the money. I said, that's what I had against you. So that was it. Well, she got fired. That was it. That was all over then. I said, I can't tell you that I'm sorry for you. I said, because I can't do it. Let's stop. How much you got? And be as descriptive as you can, you know, what yeah. the day was like. Was it cold? Was it nice? Was it hot? Whatever, okay? Okay. As I was telling you, we were really fighting for this union. And we were down at the Jane L. Tunnel, and Jane L. was on the inside with hoses. They was trying to hose us down so that we'd get out of there. And there were people of galore at that tunnel. I mean, it was jam-packed. And here comes this little old mail car. And of course, we stopped and we weren't letting anybody in there. One guy tried to get in, he got the daylight speed out of him. But this Jane L., I mean, this mail truck was going to go in, and uh, I asked him, I said, where are you going? He said, we're going into Jane L to deliver the mail. Well, let me see the mail. No, this is federal mail and nobody sees it. Said, yeah, we'll see it. Let us see it. No. So the men, Joe Perello was there and the rest of the men, there was, oh man, there was people of galore at that tunnel because that was the entrance. That was the main entrance. And we had other entrance, but that was the main entrance. And there was people of galore there. The weather was nice. It was with us, you know. So this guy insisted on going in there, and these people just grabbed that mail truck and upset it right down. When they upset it, we opened it up, and there was nothing but sandwiches and drinks in there. There was no mail, period. So they were going, they was working with Jane L. They were going in there to feed them people. Them people could have stayed in there for life, got paid for doing nothing, and stayed in there for life as long as they was feeding them and giving them something to drink. And we'd be out there striking, hot, cold, whatever it was, We'd be out there striking for the ones that were in there. And the worst part is that they got the same benefits we got after we worked so hard for it. Was it all worth it? Yes, it was. Tell me how and why it was all worth it. If I had to do it all over again, I'll tell you, even at my age, I would be down there doing it all over again. The Democrat Club had a ladies' auxiliary, and they were making sandwiches and bringing coffee to all these strikers that was down there. So... As long as they, they were feeding them, you know, they were able to stand it and stay there. And it was worth it because look what we've done for the public today. Look at the benefits they've gained by striking. And they had their say-so, they had their hands untied, they could do mostly what they wanted. If, if the boss told them something that wasn't right, they could tell them, well, you know, I just don't think this is right. So I think that it was right. We benefited a lot, a lot, a lot of people. And they were living a lot happier, I'll tell you that. I was one of them.